can't log in. Thank you. I couldn't log into my computer, Tommy. Well, what the we, heck was going on? I don't know, but we're live. Hey guys, welcome to today's episode of TFL Now, and it's TFL Now Off-Road, Tommy, because we are all about off-roading, because me and you just got back from, well, Moab. No, actually, we went to Telluride, where we ran some pretty cool... <laughs> we didn't go to Moab. No, we didn't, but we <laughs> could have gone to Moab. We ran some really cool uh, trails mm -hmm. uh, in your Lifted Wrangler, and so we're going to talk about that, but first, let's get to today's news, and then, before the news actually let me give you a preview of what's coming up we're going to give you the top 10 most off-road worthy overlanding vehicles the top 10 vehicles you might want to take around the world yeah for and guess, sure and guess what what a lot of them are toyotas a lot of them are toyotas <laughs> of so course. let's talk about what we just did actually we just ran black bear pass yep um in like you said our 2016 jeep wrangler jk so black bear pass is one of the premier colorado trails it's rated at, at a difficult level because it's got this huge sweeping cliff and there are some really, really tight switchbacks that require you to back up and down a few times. And it was just an incredible trip. I think you missed the, the headline. What makes it difficult is that if you get a tire wrong, you go creaming down the 2,000 foot cliff right. to the bottom and land on someone's home in Telluride. Right, yeah. yeah that's, that's what makes it hard, right? The, the fact that like, like right next to you when you're passengering, which I was, is a 2,000 foot drop onto, well, rocks and pointy sticks. Yeah, that's not ideal. <laughs> not <laughs> ideal. So our news today is about the Moab Edition Wrangler JL. Can I stop you for one sec, Tommy, for getting that? Roman, your collar. Is it? Is it? Thank you very much. Appreciate it. I'll fix that. Yeah. Okay, cool. thanks. Thank you. Yeah, so our um, first news of the day is about the <laughs> Kaiser Case 499. Hi. Thanks, Kaiser. Welcome to the hood. Yeah, dude. Nice to have you aboard, man. That's great. Thank you, Kaiser. We appreciate it. So our first story is about the new Moab Edition Wrangler. This is not the first time that Moab has um, had its own Wrangler. It's been <laughs> done before. And uh, the thing about the Special Edition Wranglers are they are not few and far between. They make a lot of them. The Moab one, the last generation, JK, I remember had like a um, gecko lizard on it. Or Gecko Lizard Prince, if I recall it? right. I, I think so. I thought it had like a map of the hood on it. it or maybe it had a map of the trails on the Yeah, the map of the trails on the hood. Maybe I saw a lizard once on a Wrangler. <laughs> well, so what, what, what about the new Moab edition? So this news comes us from uh, the JL Wrangler forums. Yep. They, they shared this picture and um, the information about it. So it's based on a Sahara, essentially, yep. right? Of course. So um, dual vented Rubicon hood, Moab decals, 17 inch Rubicon style wheels. A select track full time transfer case. Yep. Select track's back in yep. Wrangler Jail. Mopar steel rock rails, limited slip differential, and it's supposedly going to start at $51,200. That a lot is of money. not inexpensive. And Tommy, I've got some news that you don't even know. Yeah. It is like literally hot off the presses. I just heard from Andre that our local Jeep dealer um, in Brighton just got their very first two liter turbo. Oh. Can you believe that? That thing was supposed to be out in April. Yeah. It is now August 10th and the dealership near us finally got a first two liter turbo. I can't believe it. They're finally hitting dealerships. Uh, it's the engine I would get. I'm sorry, I know you've got a JK with a 3.6 Pentastar, but the turbo is um, really good. Um, and they're available. So uh, if you've been jonesing for a Wrangler with a turbo, Go out and get one it's at about, your local dealership. It's about time. More than about time. Yeah, they, they've um, you know revealed that two liter a long time ago. I drove it, did a zero to sixty. It was fast. Yep. I took it off road. It was fun. What more would you want? And it's fuel efficient. Well. And it's a mild hybrid. Yeah, but it's a four cylinder. It's a mild hybrid. It's a four cylinder. That means it uh, has electricity. <laughs> Great. <laughs> exactly what I want in my Wrangler, electricity. Yeah, I take it you don't like... Uh, no, it's just more complexity to go wrong. Yeah, I yeah. Mean, it's anytime you're adding both electrification and turbocharging... It's a mild hybrid. Right, but it's still like, a, I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see what the reliability numbers are like on the 2-liter. Yeah, uh, you know, I'm always a little hesitant to be the first one to get the first year of production of anything. And yeah. that motor and Jeep has been delayed for oh, at least five months. And you, you know, you wonder why and what's going on, but it's actually that color at the local dealership. It's that orange. Is it? Yeah, it's just like that. Well, that's the red one. Okay, well, never mind. <laughs> it's, 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 it's like that if it were orange. So today we're talking about the top 10 new overland vehicles 
we think are perfect for the job. So these are some of the most rugged and capable off-road vehicles out of the box. They're a great platform for building overland rigs. And we should talk about what you look for in an overland rig, right? So first off, dependability. Yes. Second off, probably off-road ability. Yes. You need space. Yes. You need a long range. You need a rooftop tent. You don't need a rooftop tent. Yes, you do. <laughs> I, saw, I saw so, this is why we're doing the show. When we were running Black Bear Pass, uh, there were so many vehicles with rooftop tents. It's become a huge thing. That is like the symbol of <laughs> Yeah, it is a symbol of overlanding. overlanding. And you guys may be wondering, what's the difference between overlanding and camping? Yeah, what is the difference between overlanding and camping? What is the difference? Camping? Anybody want to take a gander? Why don't you spill the beans? I don't think there is a real difference. I think it's just, you know, the next form of camping, right? So overlanding originally started out in places like Australia where you had to go across the entire continent and you didn't have access to any kind of electricity, any kind of potable water, any kind of stuff, right? You were living off the grid. And so it was a way of going around the world in a vehicle. Uh, and since then, it has become, you know, a cooler form of camping. So there is a very thin line between camping and overlanding. You know, camping you do for the weekend, overlanding you do for years or lifetimes, but the two are very similar. In my book, overlanding is kind of like camping with a purpose, right? It's right. traveling with a purpose. You're, you're, you're going over extended periods of time or extended distances, and you're seeing new things, you're living outdoors off the grid. That's kind of in my definition of overlanding, but it can be anything from, you know, driving across your state to driving across the country to driving across a continent. You know, Wayne says that we need a rooftop tent. I agree, Wayne. I've been uh, emailing um, rooftop tent manufacturers trying to get one for us, uh, and I think we're close to getting one. We're going to put one on the disco, and we're going to take it, and we're going to go overlanding. So, multi-purpose reviewer says overlanding is camping focused on traveling. Camping is focused on staying in one place. I, th I think that's a pretty fair definition. Yeah, I think that's really good. And by the way, before we get to the list, let's talk about uh, ways that people can help support us so that we can go overlanding. <laughs> they can uh, get one of these hats. Yep. Only here uh, for fifty dollars. Um, plus, if you want to go a little bit less, you can get one of these um, TFL car, TFL truck patches. These are brand new. Twenty-five. Yeah. We also have stickers for ten, and then welcome to the hood for five. Yep. So you know, I think we gotta get to the list now. Yes. I so think we gotta go 10? for it. So number ten on our list is the Mercedes-Benz G-Class. This is a vehicle that's been around since the late 1970s, originally developed as a military vehicle. Long before you were born. Long before I was born. When I was a youngster. Yeah. And it's developed a reputation for being very tough off-road, very durable, and very capable at traveling for long distances. So let's tell them what we did. So we, in, in two days, we drove for, gosh, 800 miles or something. So we drove from Boulder to Ure, yeah. which is like an eight-hour drive. Then we ran Imogene. Mm -hmm. Then we went to bed. We yep. got up, did Black Bear Pass, and then we drove back to Boulder. Yeah. That's a long. And in that time, we actually saw two G-Wagons with rooftop tents. One was camped along the side of the road where they were camping and one was going down the highway. So people are using G-Wagons for overlanding. Because right. you guys may think, who's going to use a $150,000 vehicle? But people are using them. Well, I mean, and they don't have to be a $150,000 vehicle, right? Right. It can be much less than that. So If you get a used one. Yeah, you can get a used one yeah. for fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen thousand dollars $18,000. AMGs are probably more like twenty five. Well, I'm talking about like European imports. Right, those, yeah. The, the diesel ones. And then, you know, the G-Wagon came to the U.S. We should emphasize we were talking about the United States. Yes. We were, we we're talking about our overland rigs. Um, and when it came back to the United States in 0203, it, it came back with all the luxury goodies and a big V8, right? And then there were the AMG models with low profile tires. So the ones we typically see here in the United States are the AMG Pro Focus 55s yes. or 63s or 65s. The four by four squared is 227,000. If you can get one, which you can't. Uh, the uh, four liter twin turbo with 416 horsepower and 450 pound foot of torque and 17 point, two point, 17 po inches of ground clearance, <laughs> right? That's the one that me and Nathan drove. Yeah. Uh, those are badass, and it's my dream truck. So if I could have one, I'd get the 4 by 4 square. Probably not for overlanding, because um, I guess if you can afford the thing, you probably afford the gas for it. Uh, but, um, you know, there's a new one coming. Mm -hmm. uh, people have driven it in Europe. We weren't uh, there, unfortunately. Uh, but I'm hoping that we get an invite soon to go out to drive the new one, because uh, I'm super stoked. That's just a really badass vehicle. Would I use it for overlanding? Probably not. It's expensive to repair. Uh, it's got, you know, way too much horsepower. But they're really over-engineered. Yes. I mean, and they have a lot of space. You can tow a lot. You can put a lot on the roof. They're really a durable vehicle. So you can take them overland. There are people that do, but you have to have real deep pockets. Yeah, the people we saw looked like they were, I think they had California plates. 
Yes, they yeah. did. And they also had like a $5,000 rooftop tent. Yeah, and, and, the, and the guy had like really expensive like hiking shoes. <laughs> okay, I, I didn't notice the hiking shoes. I noticed shoes. the hiking <laughs> shoes. They looked like they were like a pair of $1,000 Gucci hiking shoes. So, so that's not exactly the kind of image that you want when you're overlanding. But nevertheless, that's what people do because overlanding has become so huge. All right, number nine, dude. Number nine is the Ford F-150 and the Ford F-150 Raptor. This is kind of a weird one. And like we said, it's United States. We're talking about overlanding, right? Yes. And the F-150 makes a lot of sense here in the U.S. because it's just so popular and part availability is so rampant. And if you get the F-150 Raptor, you get a lot of the off-road ability as well. Starts at 50K. The cool thing about the Raptor, of course, is that... Uh, it's got pretty much everything you'd want in an overlander. It's got tons of space. Yeah. It's got tons of power. It's yep. got tons of room. Yep. It's got tons of like macho street cred. So you could build it out into a really cool overlander that'll be a quarter of the price of a G wagon. Uh, we did see a lot of old F-150s at the Overland Expo, right? The, the, the thing about the F-150 is it's such a ubiquitous truck in America that people are definitely using them for overlanding. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. No, I, I think you're spot on there. Plus, it's durable. Yeah. Right, F-150s are trucks that are built to do a serious amount of work on a daily basis, and they're just built well, especially the older ones with the simple V8s, obviously available in four-wheel drive with the low-range transfer case. So you do have a lot of that baked-in ability, but you also get a huge bed, you can get racks for them to put tents on them, all sorts of goodies. If you're traveling out into, you know, sub-Saharan Africa, an F-150 may be a poor choice. Yeah, you can't get parts. No, but if you're traveling across New Mexico over a week trip, right? Yep. The F-150 is perfect for that. It's uh, Obviously, we have to talk about range, fuel efficiency. It's not, not, bad. not too it's bad. 36 gallon fuel tank. Yeah, huge fuel tank, which is what you want. Um, and Christopher says, I love my F-150. It's got 334,000 miles. I want to get a new one. There Good you go. You, Christopher. There you go. And then maybe somebody will buy it and turn it into an overland rig. William says the Raptor is too wide. It is too wide, but um, we did Black Bear Pass, and the video will be out there. We were being followed by a bunch of lowlanders from Kansas. Flatlanders. Well, either way, <laughs> they're still at sea level. And uh, uh, there was a Jeep followed by a Raptor, followed by a Tacoma. Yeah. And there's a part on Black Bear Pass which you have to make this hairpin turn. If you get one wheel wrong, you're going to go creaming into the abyss. Uh, and we didn't think the Raptor could do it, but it did it. So I. I based the whole video basically on saying the thing is way too wide, but he was out there with the rest of us. So maybe uh, maybe it's more um, more useful than I thought. All right, number eight, Tommy. So number eight on our list is the Jeep Grand Cherokee Trailhawk, another one that you probably won't see cruising around sub-Saharan Africa. But nope. it is a cool vehicle, um, available with a 3.6. Um, you can get a 5.7, and then, you know, there's also a diesel option, and diesels make a lot of sense for overlanding. A, because... They have extreme range, yep. right? They get good fuel efficiency. Yep. Um, and if you are going out to South America or a lot of these other less developed countries, diesel fuel is readily available. Yeah, stuff with sticks in it. Well, yeah. I, I don't think your three liter eco diesel is going to enjoy the sticks very much. It starts at 43,595. There's a five liter, 5.7 liter Hemi V8. Of course, there's an eco diesel, which we discussed. And it's got 10.8 inches of ground clearance. So one of the key things that you need for an overlander is the ability to get a rooftop tent. And so I'm not sure there's an aftermarket that's quite yet developed for overlanding for Grand Cherokees uh, because you need to be able to kind of get that scaffolding so that you can put some serious weight mm -hmm. uh, on the uh, vehicle, right? Like a Subaru Outback has uh, rails, but you can only put 185 pounds. Right. And that would be the weight of the tent. It may be you, I saw not one, me. I saw one today with a rooftop tent on. Really? Yeah, a brand new one with a rooftop tent. Um, but yeah, you know, you have the recovery points with the Trailhawk. You have a lot of the off-road goodies. So it is an interesting choice, maybe not one that you'd expect. But, but we have to talk about, obviously, reliability. FCA tends to struggle yep. with reliability. So that is a concern, which is why. And that, and that is why, multipurpose reviewer, you will never find a Land Rover Defender on this list. because. <laughs> <laughs> it's not dependable. Well, let's be real. Two multi-purpose reviewer, they don't make a Land Rover Defender anymore. Yes, These they are don't. New yeah, vehicles. These are new vehicles. All right, number seven. So number seven on the list is a vehicle we s are starting to see a lot of Overland experience with, especially at the Overland Expo. That is the Chevrolet Colorado ZR2. Starts at 42, 43,000. Comes with either a 3.6 liter or the one you want for overlanding, the Baby Duramax 2.0. 
four? It says two point eight. Is there two point eight? eight? Really? Yeah, it's yep. got the uh, Multimatic shocks and eight point nine inches of ground clearance, and it's a pickup truck, which are really useful. So we had this long discussion about how useful pickup trucks. He thinks like a Forerunner is more useful than a Tacoma. Tacoma because you can put your stuff and it won't get stolen. But you can build out a nice rack over a pickup truck, and then you put a, a topper over the cab, right, that you can lock, and then in the cab you put shelving units so that you can have all your slide out stuff like your uh, kitchen and your uh, power and your, you know, sleep sleep stuff like your tent, right? Uh, that all works in a pickup truck, especially if the topper has a side opening, which some of them do have, especially for overlanding, plus you could put your awning. So you have to have a tent and an awning, but of my, course. But my thing is, like, if you're, if you're putting a topper in a truck yeah. and you're putting a storage system in the back of yeah. the truck, why not just get a 4Runner? Because trucks are cool. Okay. <laughs> They are! <laughs> well, you do get a lot of the capability of a truck, yeah. which you may not get in a, in a similarly equipped vehicle. But the, the, Dura, the Duramax, once again, very fuel efficient, Yes. Um, long range. Colorado ZR2 front and rear locking differentials, really solid tires right out of the factory. And we saw a lot of these at the Overland Expo. These are really becoming popular. All right, number six. Number six on our list. Your favorite. Can you guess? Can you guys guess what that is? Yeah, it's, the, uh, it's not my favorite, but it is a good vehicle for this list. It's the Jeep Wrangler JL Rubicon. You, specifically the unlimited because you do need the extra space for the, the four doors. Yeah, the, the stuff that you're going to be uh, hauling. 41 grand, 3.6 liter Pentastar, 10.1 um, inches of ground clearance. It depends on the spec, right? They obviously start cheaper depending on which one you get. But the you see, you see a lot of these two now, and they do make roof racks for Wranglers. Well, we saw them out there this yesterday, actually. Tons of them with tons roof racks and, and ladders. And, yeah, and jerry cans and spare fuel and spare water and all sorts of your typical overlanding shovels and goodies. So they're, they're really popular as an overland vic rig, or they're going to be with the new JL. You see a lot of JKs out there, but this is really the last kind of unexpected one on our list, I think, because we've talked so far about a lot of the U.S. domestics here, right? And five through one are your more traditional old school overland rigs that you think of the second you think of overlanding, right? Yeah, you mean like the Fiat 500. No, <laughs> not what I mean at all. Okay. <laughs> uh, people are saying uh, there's way more space in the truck for equipment than there is like in a four-wheeler. Yeah, that's true. true. Yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, there's a lot more. There's a lot more stuff. You know, overlanding has become uh, the new form of camping for you youngsters, you millennials out there, right? Yeah. Right. Nobody wants. I think this is what happened. I think what happened was uh, people still had that need to go explore America, but. Uh, you don't want to do it the way that like my generation did, right? You don't want to go in the back of the Woody station wagon and go see Yellowstone. What you want to do is you want to do it your way. And so overlanding has become the new way of uh, seeing America. As opposed to an RV, you have a camper. By the way, on our new off-road channel, we've got a really cool uh, camper, Boreas camper trailer. Yeah, so trailers are the new hot thing as they well. Are, yeah. And you can mount, you know, trailer top tents to a trailer. You're, you're moving a lot of that weight from the top of your vehicle, which, you which know, is a bad place. It's a really bad place for a lot of weight and putting them on a trailer. But then there's compromises in terms of off-roadability and where do you put the trailer and there's there's other but other do, issues with it. Do run over to TFL Off-Road and check out Andre's review of this uh, Boreas uh, camper trailer. It's really cool. Uh, it's a very expensive $25,000, but this stuff is Still cheap compared to, you know, like buying a mobile home. Yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. And, and you can go a lot further. You can go a lot further. So number five on our list is the vehicle that really started the hashtag van life movement. Yeah, perfect, Dad. It's the Mercedes-Benz Sprinter 4x4. And it really is a, a super unique van because it has four-wheel drive, which is unusual in a Basic van to Basic form of four-wheel drive, yeah. Well, I mean, you can get a low-range yes, transfer case. you can, yep. So it's a real four-wheel drive system. Yep. Plus, you don't need your rooftop tent because look at all the room you've got in the back. So camper conversions are huge with Sprinter 4x4s. Uh, it's a great platform for an overland rig because you have tons of room on the inside. And let's be real, if you're here in the U.S., not a, lot of, not a lot of other options in terms of four-wheel drive vans. Yeah, it's surprisingly capable. Nathan and I did a video that's up on TFL Truck where we took it off-road, uh, and it's really great. And really, the best thing about it is you've got this huge bit of glass in front of you, and it's like you're watching a nature show as you're driving through yeah. a nature show. It's really cool. Uh, it is a little heavy. It is a little thirsty. It's a little it, expensive, it's too. A little, it's a lot expensive. Uh, they start at 45,000, but I think the 4x4s four four now are more realistically in the 60 to 70 range. Yeah, you won't find one for under 50. Yeah, and then you got then you got to build it out. Yeah. Uh, and it is a little top heavy, so the problem, of course, with having everything like a rooftop tent on top of it is that you're moving the center of gravity up, and when you're doing trails where 
uh, you know, you don't want to tip the vehicle over where there's a lot of articulation. Having all that weight on the roof is, is not, not good. good. Yeah, it just makes it feel really tippy and really scary. So, number four on our list. Yep. Here we go. Here we go into the Toyotas, and it's not actually Toyota. Well, no. it is in other markets, it but Toyota. it's the Lexus GX. Yep. So this is the smaller of the two that we're going to be mentioning from the Lexus Based brand. Based on the Prado. Yeah, it, uh, uh, abroad it's known as the Toyota Prado. Here in the U.S., it's available with a 301 horsepower V8. Right. right. We don't get a lot of the smaller engine choices that you may get abroad. It's also expensive, starting price of $52,155, but it is extraordinarily well built. Yeah, and you know, Lexi are great for overlanding because inevitably they become cheaper than the Toyota equivalent of them. Right, because well, well, they, they, they depreciate, and that's especially true for a number one vehicle, which we won't get to yet, but they depreciate much faster than the Toyota version for some reason, and that's because the Toyota versions are considered more off-road worthy, even though, you know, and I think it's, it's what the brand has to do with, right? The brand is based on, like, luxury and, well, let's face it, people my age. Yeah. Whereas Toyota is a much more youthful brand, and so that, I think, is reflected in the value of the thing. But in general, Alexi, at least this one, is very similar to the Toyota version, and you might as well go for Alexis if you want to save yourself some money. Well, you can't get the Toyota version. In Europe, you can. Yeah. Right, right in Prado. But th the difficulty with this is um, off-road accessory availability. Mm -hmm. So if you talk they're, about our, yeah, hard if you talk about a number one vehicle, you have a lot of accessories available. This one, though. Wayne, you are wonderful. Thank you. You get a hat. Uh, please let us know uh, if you want it signed or unsigned, and send us an email to info at TFL Car where we yeah. should send you the hat. Thank uh, you, Wayne. Appreciate it. And Wayne says the Toyota FJ60 Land Cruiser would be a great overland rig with a manual uh -huh. transmission, of course. Just stay tuned. Well, so the FJ60 Land Cruiser is a many, many generations old. That was yes. a really square one um, that was around in the 1980s. With the two lights. Yeah, two, two round lights. Really, really a cool rig, cool truck. They're so hard to find in any kind of acceptable condition now. Yeah, and uh, old vehicles tend not to be reliable, but it would be my certainly oh, choice for a really way cool. Tend not to be reliable. You can't kill an FJ60 Land Cruiser. This is true. Good luck they're, with they're that one. They're tractors. All right, number three. So number three on our list of our new vehicles yeah. for overlanding is the Toyota 4Runner. So the 2018 Toyota TRD Pro, the one you didn't drive, that's the 18 that I'm reading about, it's turning 43 grand, 9.6 inches of ground clearance, Fox shocks, TRD wheels. There's also an off-road model if you still want those TRD off-road goodies. Um, you know, rear differential lock, multi-terrain select, crawl control, and there's a base model too. So you don't have to go for the crazy TRD models to get capability with the Foreigner. You can get a, a standard SR5 and you'll still be able to get to a lot of the places you want to go. Yes, uh, you know, the uh, 4Runner is uh, really the only competitor the Jeep has now mm -hmm. because the other vehicles that we would have loved to put on this list, including the Xterra, which isn't being made anymore, mm -hmm. including the FJ, which isn't being made anymore, uh, now means that really the only choice that you have if you want to go seriously off-roading is the 4Runner or the Wrangler, right, in that kind of four-door. Uh, and, of course, the Toyota has a disadvantage of not being able to well, become a convertible. There's also the Land Cruiser in terms of the, you right. know, the Ford or SUVs. But I'm, I'm talking about in the, in the competing kind of price range. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. sure. Um, you can't take the top off, but there is a roof rack on the TRD Pro, which is good for having the ubiquitous rooftop tent. So, you know, uh, I really enjoyed it. Out of the three that I drove, the TRD Pros, that one felt the best to me. So that was my favorite. Uh, it was, it was just, just right. The, um, Tundra was too big, the Tacoma had that weird sitting position, and this was just right. So I, I really like the, the, the 4Runner. It's got the terrain management control, which is really good in Toyotas. It's got Toyota's legendary uh, reliability. Yep. Uh, it has a locking rear diff, yep. which is also good if you get seriously into some stuff where you can get stuck. So it's got all the off-road goodies. I, I'd highly recommend it. But number two, of course. Well, hang on. I got, I got one more thing to say before we get to number two yep. about Toyota just in general. So I, I just got back um, from a, a trip around the world. It was, it was amazing. It was a study abroad program. And it didn't matter where you were. You could be in, in the, the streets of Tokyo, right? You could be in the, um, the, the, the slums of South Africa, right? You could be in the middle of nowhere in Ghana, yep. and the one vehicle you'd see, regardless of where you were in the United States, was a Fiat 400. Or, no, <laughs> in the world. The Peugeot. No, it 404. Was, it was a Toyota Hilux. The Peugeot DS. Peugeot DS. <laughs> I mean the Citroen DS. It's the Toyota Hilux. So the Toyota Hilux is like <laughs> the go-to rugged 
off-road, go anywhere, do anything. Any kind of person, wherever you are in the world, you, you'll find a Hilux. And we don't get the Hilux in the United States, we but don't. we do get its Americanized cousin, the built, Toyota built Tacoma. San Antonio yeah. and, and Mexico, actually. So the Toyota Tacoma, um, you just drove the 2019 TRD Pro, yeah. um, 3.5 liter V6. 9.4 inches of ground clearance in the off-roading models. There's also a TRD off-road. There's also a TRD sport. There's also um, four-cylinder versions. And there's four-wheel drive and two-wheel drive configurations. But they're very different than the Hilux. Yeah, it's a much smaller truck. Uh, it's Americanized. Well, uh, the Hilux is interesting, though, because yeah. the ones you see always have a really small turbocharged four-cylinder diesel. Which we don't get. Which we will never see in the United States. So we, we end up with the bigger kind of thirsty Toyota, diesel. bring it. Just bring it. Bring it, and they will buy it. Yeah. We will buy it, but... Uh, yeah, diesel is problematic here in America. You know, the Tacoma, uh, I think, is a great truck for overlanding, but it does have some disadvantages. I hate the driving position mm -hmm. where you're sitting you know, like with your legs straight out ahead of you. I still don't buy the fact that it doesn't have rear disc brakes. Yeah, that's right? weird. It's, it's weird. Um, and um, it's expensive too. And it's it's expensive. It's pretty pricey. And probably the biggest issue with it, and this is not much of an off-road issue, but it is an on-road issue. The engine just never seems to have the right gear. It always feels like it's like trying to find the right gear, and it's always in, in the gear that's too low, right? So you're always going. Some cars you're going faster than you think. That one you're always going sl slower than you think, <laughs> right? Well, and you don't need to go fast when you're off-road, though. And it's a little thirsty. And talking <laughs> about thirsty. Yeah, is the Toyota Land Cruiser is our number one vehicle, and it just has to be, because you go to Africa, right, you go to Australia, this is the go-to overland rig, and it's partly because it's just got such a good reputation. Starts with, at 84,000. Well, with reliability. All right, these trucks are built so well, and, you know, you read the comments throughout our videos, you read the forums, you talk to the, the uh, off-road experts, and they'll tell you one of the reasons why is they're built to last 25 years. The engineers, yeah. Engineers. The en yeah, and, and, and they are incredibly well engineered, but they are also incredibly expensive here in the U.S. So once again, if you this is what we're talking about. If you want to save money, get the older LX, not the new one. So for the older LX and the older Land Cruiser, the parts are actually interchangeable. So you can take the... For um, the most part. For the most, the older versions, not, not the current one. Well, the like one, an the 80 previous. series yeah, are the, almost literally identical. Yeah, the previous generation. So you can take the bumper off of a Lexus and you can put an aftermarket bumper on it, which is the same aftermarket bumper you would put on the Land Cruiser. Mm -hmm. And so the parts are interchangeable on the older ones. Uh, and the Lexi are considerably cheaper than Land Cruiser because the Land used. Cruiser... Used. Yeah, yeah it has used. Such, a, such a reputation for being cool and overlandy and people really want them. And they're like three vehicles that you can't get at a discount used Tacoma, Land Cruiser for the most part, and Wrangler, those three. Right, they really hold their value they well. They really hold their value, yeah. So what, what does kind of um, suck being from the United States, right, and I think suck is the right word, is we only get the big thirsty V8 here, Yeah. right? And in other markets, they have this really cool engine. It's a 4.5 liter turbocharged diesel. Yeah. And it's supposed to be just incredible, but we never see it here. We get the super thirsty 5.7 liter V8, which I'm sure will last forever and ever and ever and ever. But when you're off-road, right, going really slow, getting poor mileage, it's a problem for range. So a lot of guys will pull out the spare tire on these, stick in an additional uh, fuel tank, right, yeah. and then do a tire carrier in the back. Um, and then other markets, of course, get more affordable versions. We only get the crazy expensive luxury models. So, so, so I'm not 100% certain about this, but I'm going to go there anyway because I think it really did happen. When I was overlanding with the Expedition Overland guys, they had a Toyota Land Cruiser that was done up, right, with a roof tent and a full storage a, system in the back. And a Patriot trailer, too. Was and a Patriot to trailer. I think that thing was getting right around 3 to 5 mpg off. Oof. 3 to 5. Because it, it was always, I think it had a range of about 130 on the main fuel tank. It was so thirsty. Yeah. Pulling a trailer off-road with two rooftop tents, one on the trailer, one on the Land Cruiser, is crazy, crazy, crazy. We're running out of time, Tommy. Yeah. But we've got a bonus. Yeah, we've got a weird bonus. It is the Volvo C303. No, it's not. It is the Pinsgauer and the Unimog. That is the Volvo. <laughs> it is, there it is. There's the Pinsgauer. It's not the Volvo. It's and there's the Unimog. Yeah, there's the Unimog, yeah. So the Volvo's there. So obviously the those are like, you know, like the, the, like the uh, earth roamers of the overlanding world. If you can afford one of those and if you can afford to do it upright, we've seen people. Uh, the problem with them is they're tractors. Pinsgauers and Unimogs, for the most part, are tractors. They're slow, even by modern standards, right? Yeah, and they're, they're huge. They're too. loud. They're huge. They got a lot of uh, 
We've got a lot of issues, uh, but, like, but they're like, cool. Yeah, Unimogs have like, first of all, they all have portal axles. They have like five reverse speeds. They have like 14,000 forward speeds. I mean, it's a truck, right? It's a huge truck. Um, and, you know, you go to certain markets, parts are available if you can find a mechanic to fix them. And they are incredibly expensive. We don't see any of the new ones in the United States. Um, and, like, there's all sorts of weird choices like this. If you're really weird and wrong, you get a Volvo C303. If you're cool and quirky, you get a Pinsgauer. So, it, you got all sorts of interesting options so, in terms of cab over designs. So, uh, Desert Speed Mafia says the Wrangler diesel will be the go to overlander. He's probably right when it comes out. Desert Speed Mafia says that the man is truly the best. Except, I think that I think the JT with the diesel will be the off roader, the, the Jeep truck with the diesel, not the Wrangler, but the Jeep truck. Whatever it's going to be called. That'll be the one, I think. That'll be the uh, o ultimate overlander. And why not the Land Rover Discovery? Do we have a picture of it? I think we have a Land Rover Discovery. Because hey, there's, th ours. there's ours because they're, uh, yeah, they're, well, there's no other way to put it. They're incredibly unreliable. So, um, the old ones. <laughs> they the, they the break when ones. you look at them wrong. Yeah, the old ones are unreliable. But the new ones, why, why isn't a new Discovery on this list? You know, we had this conversation. Why isn't Land Rover actually on this list? And the reason is they become too city slicker. They're just too elegant, right? They're no longer tough. They're beautiful vehicles. Land Rover still does these programs where they take them off-road, but let's face it, they're just too elegant to go off-road. I mean, this one we bought because it's all bashed up and it'll be perfect for what we're doing with it, right? You don't feel bad about pinstriping it mm -hmm. when you run up too close to a bush or a tree. So the, the old ones, too, have solid axles body on frame, yes. right? They're super rugged with not a lot of tech. It's got no air suspension. Yeah, so the new, that always fails. The new ones rely entirely on tech. Right, they rely entirely on traction control systems and air suspension to get them off road. And if, if any of those systems go wrong and you're out, you know, in, in the middle of of Morocco, right, you're gonna be stuck. And that actually happened to our friend Emmy Hall, who was running the gazelles, yep. and one of the teams was running a Land Rover LR4 that had a suspension failure, and they were like a beach turtle. Yeah, yeah. So they're just they're beautiful, they're elegant, but I don't know if they're rugged anymore. So some big news that we should share with you guys. Uh, Tommy and I are going to get to run the Rubicon Trail next week, so whoop, whoop. we won't be here uh, at this time of the week. But uh, we are doing an Ask Mr. Truck Show every week now on Thursday. So if you guys have truck questions, please come and stop by on Thursdays when Kent will be here answering all of your truck questions. And on Monday, what are you and uh, young... Uh, Michael over there talking about on the show. <laughs> what are we? Well, we are talking about the um, Volvo C three hundred three. No, not the Volvo C three hundred three. <laughs> you know, I've completely forgotten what we were talking on the show. Can you? <laughs> you guys are going to be talking about tech. Oh. And the, and the top ten worst tech. Oh, in new cars. In new cars yeah. that, that we can live without. So it, that'll be a fun show. We're going to be talking about all this stuff that we can't stand because we drive a lot of different cars. So there's a lot of tech that is good and there's some that isn't. And we're yep. going to talk about the stuff that isn't good. Yep, for sure. All right, guys, thanks for watching. Remember, check out TFL Car, TFL Truck, TFL Off-Road. TFL Now. TFL Now. And are we going to get some more videos up on uh, TFL Classics? Maybe we will. Maybe we will. I think I see a TFL Classics video coming next week. What vehicle would that be, Tommy? It will not be the Volvo C303. But what vehicle will it be? The International Harvester Scout that we have. You've been asking for it, and we're going to give it to you. That's right. We're going to get together, and we're going to take that thing, and we're going to do some videos with it. So stay tuned. That'll be on Classics, where we haven't published a video for two years, but we're bringing it back because of you guys <laughs> donating to us. We're able to actually you know, get editors and videographers and actually make more videos. So thank you very much, and have a great weekend. Ciao.